Well, good morning. You know, traveling always comes with a lot of challenges, right? I mean, it seems like every trip that you go on, there's always some crazy thing that seems to, to take place. And, and years ago, we have, we have, my wife and I, we have four kids, and when we only had two of them, um, our two oldest girls, we took a trip to Williamsburg, Virginia. Anybody ever been to Williamsburg, Virginia? We, we were going there to visit my wife's um, great-grandmother. She was a spunky, just woman of God. She was just a lot of fun, who to be around. And, and at the time, you know, we were planning for a good family, a big family. So we traded in our car and bought this big Chevy conversion van. You know, it was really nice and plush, crazy inside. It was used and it was, we were going to use and wear that thing out with our kids in it. And so as we were traveling, you know, with the kids were little and they were kind of, one of them was learning to be potty trained. So we had a little pop little potty in there, you know, it was just perfect little setup. But, but we're traveling, you know, we're headed, you know, through Ohio and, and my, my in-laws were with us, my father-in-law and mother-in-law were with us, my wife, my two little girls at the time. And as we're traveling, we decided to swap these drivers so that, you know, we we're planning on just cruising through the night. How many of you drive through the night? I mean, it's just crazy. You know, it's like you make good time, right? We're going to drive through the night because we're too cheap to stay in a hotel, right? So we're just going to cruise through the night. And so my father-in-law swap, you know, and he's driving and, and it's, you know, getting dark. And we cross over the river from Ohio into West Virginia, and we're taking this shortcut um, where it, the, the road actually follows along the riverbed down in the valley. It's a two-lane highway, and it just so happened that it's pitch black outside, and there's this dense fog that settled in. All right. And so, you know, my father-in-law is driving. I'm in the back. I got the, there's a whole backs of bed, you know, it's laying down. I'm supposed to be sleeping because I'm going to take over driving after I sleep for a couple hours. And there's this thick, dense fog. You could not see anything. A two lane highway. Can you see how the story is going, right? There's this two lane highway. And you know, when a man's behind the wheel, you know what? You don't slow down. You just keep going, you know? And so my father-in-law's got to say, he's not here this morning, so I can tell this story. They're flying in today, so, so they're going to miss this whole thing. So he's got his hands, you know, clenched to the steering wheel, and, you know, and he's driving and just trying to see through this thick fog. You know, we may, he may have slowed down, I don't know, maybe to 45. I'm not really sure. But we're still cruising. My mother-in-law is there in the front seat, and my wife's there in the back with the, the two girls, and it was just such a peaceful moment to sleep in, you know? No, it was tense. I mean, it was crazy because in this moment, Moment as you're traveling, you're just kind of just waiting for just the worst to happen, right? Because you can't see anything. And, and, and it just it goes from bad to worse, you know, because there's all this commotion going on. You need to slow down, you know, all this stuff going on. And, and you know, I'm trying to sleep. How can you sleep with all that going on? And it's like, oh my gosh, you can't see anything. We need to pull over. Now the challenge is you can't pull over because it's just as dangerous to pull off the side of the road as it is just to keep going. You know, and I'm sitting there thinking at any moment there's going to be this semi appearing on the other side of this dense fog, and it's just going to be over. You know, it's like your worst nightmare is going to unfold in any moment. Now, let me just tell you, it gets worse than that, all right? My father-in-law hasn't driven this van before, and what I didn't tell him is that there is a short in the wire for the lights, and you can't mess with the little switch that you pull the little lever back, because if you do, the headlights will go off. So guess what my father-in-law does? You know how we do. We know, we're taught, don't turn your brights on when there's fog, because it doesn't do anything, right? It just makes it worse. So he's Playing with the light switch, and guess what happens? The lights go out. I mean, it's pitch black, dense fog, no headlights on this van. And I'm like panicking in the back, you know? And it's just this really intense moment that just went from bad to worse. And the good thing is we eventually got through that dense, thick fog and made it safely by the grace of God to West Virginia. I never slept a moment <laughs> after that. I was wide awake. There was no, no sense of even trying to sleep, but it was a very terrifying moment. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is I'm just trying to get you ready for the story we're looking at today. It's one of my favorite stories when it comes to the Christmas story. And it's the story of the shepherds that are out in the fields nearby. So the last couple of weeks, we're in this series called Travel Light. And we've just been talking about how it's just easy to go through life and just carry a lot of baggage with us in this life that God never intended for us to carry. And we all have different kinds of baggage. The first week, we looked at Joseph and, you know, Joseph's life. I mean, God just interrupted his life with this child, the son of God. He was not expecting this to take place. He didn't, he didn't really trust Mary at that point in time. And so Joseph came to this place, we looked at the first week, that he just had to let go of control and trust God's plan 
was bigger and better than his. And then last week, Julie shared with us the whole story of Mary and, and just how when, it was, when a child was born, as it was mostly like us, you know, when we have a kid, you know, your whole family comes around to celebrate that moment. And for the, for the Jewish people, there would be a midwife there. There would be a lot of family members there helping care, being there for the family, helping care. The midwife would wrap the child. She was explaining all the background and they had nobody. They were all alone. And, and there's just a lot of white space there that we don't really know. But it just seems that, that they just were just rejected their family rejected them because it just appeared that Mary had committed adultery and had a child while they were under contract in the process of if, you know, solidifying their marriage. And so they were just rejected. There was no family there when Jesus was born. They were all alone in this stable with these animals when the birth of our Savior came into this world. And so just, just learning just how we need to let go of bitterness and, and resentment, all these things that we can often carry with us as baggage in our life. And today I want to look at just letting go of fear. <laughs> Because we're going to look at these shepherds in a moment. They just become incredibly terrified. And their worst nightmare comes upon them in an instant. And, and, and it's like, so we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 18. You can follow along up here on the screens. If you have a Bible, you can open up. You can scribble, mark it up. But I, I love this story of the shepherds. So we're going to pick up in verse 8. And this is right after, picking up after last week, when the birth of Jesus takes place. All right? So Luke, as he unpacks this, he starts in verse 8. He says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. So right out of town, outside of Bethlehem, in these fields nearby, right when Jesus was born, are these shepherds, all right? And they're keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, for a shepherd, nighttime is a time to be on high alert, right? I mean, it's like my father-in-law driving down the road, trying, you know, his hands clenched to the steering wheel, just trying to see through this dense fog. I mean, that's kind of how the shepherds were, because that's when predators often would come and steal sheep. And oftentimes they would make these makeshift pens and the shepherd would be the gate. That there's no way to get through that pen unless they got through the shepherd. And that's why Jesus references later that I am the gate. All right, because that's what the shepherd would do. All right, he put himself there. But the thing is, is that these predators, these animals would come at night to attack a sheep or someone would come and steal them. And so to lose a sheep meant losing money. So at nighttime was their time to be on high alert, hands clutched on the steering wheel, just looking through the darkness. You know how it is. I mean, there was no city lights, right? You know how hard it is to see things in the dark. And sometimes, let's be honest, you, you see things that aren't really there, right? Our mind just kind of plays tricks on us. I mean, I remember as a kid seeing monsters and they were nowhere around, but your mind just thinks that they're there. And, you know, so these shepherds are just watching over their flocks at night. You know, just this tense moment, making sure that nothing is going to attack one of their sheep. And then in this moment, all right, verse 9, it says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were what? They were terrified. I mean, in this moment of intensity, you know, you're, you're trying to see, and you're just hoping there's not a semi on the other side of this thick, dense fog. You know, you're just hoping to get through this, this, this part of the trip. And in this moment, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I love this story, this angel just shows up, and they're terrified. Now, now the reason I, I know none of you have heard me tell this story before, I, I just love this because, you know, I'm kind of a prankster, and I'm the guy that would just be hiding around a corner, you know, when it's dark and scared, scaring somebody, and it was just like, I just would love to bend a fly on the back of one of the sheep and watch this scenario unfold, because I can just imagine behind the veil of eternity that this angel, there's like, there's no easy way to go about doing this, Right? I mean, there's no easy way just to, to kind of like show up out of the fog, you know, and just walk on the scene. I mean, there's no way to do it, you know. He, he's got to appear to these shepherds to, to announce the birth of the Savior. And all of a sudden, it's like, boom, he's there. And it's not just that he's there. It says the glory of the Lord shone around them. All right, when we look back in the Old Testament, we see that this is when, when Solomon dedicated the temple that there was the same kind of language. There was this glory of the Lord. It was this manifest presence known as the Shekinah glory. And it was like this thick, dense fog that settled in as they're sacrificing all these animals before God in the dedication of the temple. And they're all on their faces just worshiping the Lord God in, 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 during the time of Solomon dedicating the temple. And so there's this glory, this manifest presence of God. And there's this angel there. And these guys are terrified. Now, 
we need to stop and ask the question, so why were the shepherds terrified? Apart from being scared out of their wits, right, because this angel appears, there's really a deeper reason why they're terrified. Because for the shepherds, most scholars would say, they, they just kind of were expecting the worst. They were expecting the worst because of their occupation, the things that they did. It just kind of kept them away from all the things that God really required for them to do according to the law. And so I want to do is I just want to kind of unpack this and just look at just, you know, th this fear is what for them, it was like this fear of where they stood with God. All right, this is why they're terrified in this moment. It's like this is like the end when Jesus comes back. All right, and, and we all want to kind of know that we got to prepare for that day, right? And some of us, you know how it is, like when it comes, how many of you wait till the last night to study for your exams when you're in school, right? I mean, how many of you never studied for exams? We're in church, you can just, right? <laughs> so, so you know how it is, some people, you know, we wait till the last moment. Well, for the shepherds, you know, their, their greatest fear was they did not know where they stood with God because of everything they've been hearing from the religious leaders, the things that required according to their faith. There was all of these issues and they just weren't sure. And I think for some of us sometimes, we're not really sure where we stand with God. You know, if, if we were to die tonight, where would we be? Right? And this is kind of what these shepherds are feeling. It's like, where do we stand with God? And now all of a sudden, this is the moment. This is our worst fear coming upon us. The angel, this angel of the Lord is here and the glory of the Lord's here. And this, now it's a day of, of reckoning. Now I've got to give an account for my life, and we're not ready for this. And so I want to look at just three reasons why the shepherds were terrified. Because there's a deep issue of fear that's going on here. And one of the reasons why is that they felt unworthy. They really dealt with a lot of fear and feeling that they were unworthy. They did not measure up the standards that were put on them. One of the things was just simply a tradition, which was a hand-washing tradition that the Jews started. It wasn't even in the law. They just started this tradition. And because the, the, the shepherds did not participate in this hand-washing ceremony, because their occupation kept them out in the fields, constantly taking care of the sheep, they were considered unclean. And oftentimes, in order to protect your sheep, there'd be dead carcasses, There'd be snake skin, different things in the field, and you'd have to pick that up to keep sheep, because sheep, as we know, according to Scripture, sheep aren't very smart, right? I mean, they'll just go right off a cliff. They'll, they'll do things that they need to be led. And the Scriptures often refers to us as being like sheep. We need to be led. We need the Spirit of God to lead us and guide us through this life, all right? And so the shepherds had to pick up all these dead carcasses, and so according to the law, they were unclean. And so they couldn't go and, and worship. And if they were to go into town, even if they were to participate in a hand-washing ceremony, when they went into town, they had to sh shout out, say, unclean, unclean. Now, could you imagine how humiliating that would be to have to go whenever you come to church, you know, to walk in the door, unclean, I'm unclean, stay away from me. I got a bad cold, right? And everybody would be like, don't shake my hand, fist bump. Right? I mean, could you imagine announcing that you were unclean? I mean, that would just be humiliating. It would be demoralizing. And for the shepherds, that's kind of where they live because their occupation kept them busy all the time. And what's crazy and ironic is they're the ones who provided the sheep for the sacrifices. But yet, they were looked down upon as lowly shepherds. They were unworthy. They didn't measure up to the standard that the religious people imposed on them. They were unworthy. A second reason why they just, they were terrified is because they felt inadequate. Not only were they unworthy, they felt inadequate. They didn't have the same training and education that other people did. And so they just didn't feel like they just measured up to the standard. They didn't get a lot of likes on social media, like some of us today, right? <laughs> right? It's just like, man, you, you want people to notice you. You want people to recognize you, but you're just kind of these, these outcasts, these rejects. And so for them, they just never measured up socially. They never measured up spiritually. They just, they just never got any likes. Nobody followed their posts. Nobody paid any attention to them at all. So they felt very unworthy, felt very inadequate. And the third thing is they just felt unloved. They were people that nobody wanted to be around. Jewish parents would always encourage their kids, when you grow up, you know, don't be a shepherd. <laughs> Please don't be a shepherd. That is a terrible occupation. 
And that is one that's just marked with just the riffraff, the low life, the scum of the earth. Don't become a shepherd. And so the, these, these shepherds just felt very unloved. There was nothing that they could do. And matter of fact, if, if something went missing while they were out in the fields nearby watching their sheep and something went missing in town, the shepherds got blamed for it. They were considered thieves. And if they were witnessing a crime that was taking place, they couldn't even go to the court of law and give a testimony because it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't even be recognized. So they were just like the lowest of the lowest class. They were looked down upon. And so here they're dealing with unworthiness. They're dealing with inadequacy. They're feeling unloved. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. God doesn't love me. God doesn't see me to where I measure up. And so, so this is like a day of reckoning. The angel of the Lord just shows up. The glory of the Lord's there. And, and now we're, we're, this is doomsday. We're done. We're toast. It's over. And so they are terrified to the core of their being. And here's what's really cool. The this, this story just goes on here. And what I want us to do is to kind of look at what we can learn from the shepherds when it comes to letting go of fear. Because I think for some of us here in this room, don't you love my old suitcase? I had to get my dad to get this out of his attic for me. But I think for some of us, we carry around some old baggage that's been around in our lives for a long time that God wants us to get rid of. God never intended for us to carry it around. And we have this baggage, this is full of all kinds of hurts, bitterness as we looked at, control, whatever it is, fears. Fear of what's going to happen if I actually let go of this baggage in my life because we kind of hide behind it. We kind of, this is our, our safety net. As long as I'm afraid, you know, I, I'm okay. And we just want to hold on to it and cling to it. And so we can learn here from these shepherds because they've been carrying around this, this old baggage for a long time, hearing all these hurtful words through the years. Just not being good enough, not measuring up to the standard of God. And now the day of reckoning is on them and this whole story unfolds. And we can learn some things from the shepherds when it comes and letting go of their baggage and their baggage of fear. And so we're just gonna look at three things because sometimes fear can just paralyze us. I've heard pastors say that fear kind of stands for false evidence that appears real. You know, it's kind of like in the dark, we tend to see things that aren't really there and it's not really true. And God wants us to release and let go of that baggage that we're carrying around. So the first thing I want us to look at, number one, as the story continues on, is, it, is it, when it comes to the shepherds and it comes to us in our own lives, that God meets us where we are to unpack some baggage. He meets us right where we are on our turf to help us let go of some of this stuff we've been carrying, this unwanted baggage we've been carrying through our lives. So let's look at verse 10. So this angel's responding back to them. They're, they're terrified. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Now, that's easy to say, right? <laughs> I mean, in this moment, it, it would just, you know, like I said, I would just love to have been there to watch this unfold. And it'd be hard not to be afraid, but the angel says, do not be afraid. Now, what's interesting, this is a common theme throughout the birth of our Savior, when the angel showed up to Mary to tell her, look, you're going to give birth to a son. He's like, how's this going to be? It's the Holy Spirit's going to upon you. And he says, look, don't be afraid. This is the work of God. Same thing with Joseph. Don't be afraid. This is the work of God. For these, these shepherds right? And it feels like, don't be afraid because I bring you. And I really want us to kind of notice how Luke personalizes here as he writes his gospel account of Jesus. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Verse 11, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to who? To you. A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Verse 12, this will be a sign to who? To you. That you, what you're going to find, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And I think sometimes in, in the midst of fear, and, and this baggage that we, we carry around with us, it's hard for us to see past the baggage. It's hard for us to see past this, all, all these hurts and habits and hang-ups we have in our lives, to see the fullness of all that God has for us in Christ. And, and in this moment, these shepherds are hiding behind their fear, and the angel says, look, you, you, can, you can let go of it, because what God has done is it's for you. It's for you. God has this for you you. And, and I can only imagine in this moment, you know, as, as, as these shepherds, they travel from one town to the next, they're in these fields, they're stopping, they're thinking, what, what, you, you, look, you, you've been following your GPS wrong. <laughs> you ever end up in the wrong place following your GPS, right? 
I mean, as good as the technology is sometimes, they still miss some of the updates, right? And, and I can imagine these shepherds like, look, you got the wrong field. <laughs> it can't be us. Do you know anything about us? I mean, we're, we are the low lowlifes of the world. We're the scum of the earth. You got the wrong guy. You're at the wrong location. The city's over there where the good people are, not out here in the fields with us lowly shepherds. You've got the wrong people. And I just want to kind of point this out, that in this, these three verses here, this text, the, the, the account of the angel, it says, look, I want you to understand, the good news is for you. The Savior is for you. The sign that nobody else got to see is for you. And there's this, this personalization that God has for us, that Jesus came for you. And for me, it's a personal thing that God calls us to. And there's so many times we, we just go around with our baggage and it's like, no, you, you got the wrong person. Now, how many of you order Christmas gifts on Amazon? All right? I mean, it's kind of the end thing, right? You order online. You order online, right? I mean, it's so great. You don't have to go out and get in the crowds and yell and scream at people, right, and get mad at the cashiers. You can just click, Right? And then it shows up, and there's this, this box that shows up on your porch, and you open it up. It's like, no, this, 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 this had to be the wrong person. This is too good to be true. This, this gift can't be for me. And the angel said, no, it's for you. Quit hiding behind the baggage in your life, the fear and the junk. The Savior, the good news, the sign is for you and you and you and you. Each and every one of you, God sent his son for us. This isn't a mistake. God got the right address. Now, what I love about the word of God is when we dive into it and we, and we read through it, we just see the personalization of God's heart for us as individuals, understanding the baggage that we, we carry in our lives. One of my favorite psalms is a psalm that David wrote in Psalm 139. And it's in this moment as, as David's writing this psalm that, it, that it's like he's, he's got this old baggage, this old suitcase that he's just carrying in, in his life. And he, and he starts off, this is how the psalm starts. Get got it up here on the screens. He says, God, look, you've searched me. You, you've gone through my baggage, my luggage. You know what's in here. You know what my life consists of is what he's saying. You've searched me, Lord. And you know me. You know when I sit. You know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. He goes on. He says, whatever I do, wherever I say, whatever, you know my thoughts. You know everything about me. And he goes on. He says, that there's no place that I can go that you're not there. And what's amazing, I didn't put this in the notes, but at the end of this psalm, as he goes through this whole psalm, he, he, he cries out to God and he says, God, he said, here's the deal. I'm giving you permission to open just the baggage in my life and unpack it and fill it with what I need. And he says, search me, God, search, search my bags, search my life. Show me if there's anything in here that is not according to your ways and help me just to get rid of it and lead me in the way everlasting. And, and I love that psalm because David's like, God, you know everything about me, and you know this baggage that I'm carrying around, and I just don't want to keep carrying it anymore. I want to let it go. So search my heart. It's a great psalm to pray to God. Search my heart. Search me, God. Help me to know that the good news is for me, that the Savior is for me, and that this sign is exclusively for me, that, that God didn't show this and reveal this to anybody else. Nobody else got to witness the stable where the Savior was born except these, these low-life shepherds that are out in the fields nearby watching their flocks, the ones who felt unworthy and inadequate and unloved. They got to experience what nobody else got to experience. And so God comes to meet us right where we're at to unpack just this unwanted baggage in our life. And the second thing, number two, and the second thing we see happen is that then God packs what we need for the journey. And so 
In this moment, when we're driving down the road, you know, my father-in-law's got his, his death grip on the steering wheel trying to see through the frog fog, you know, and then the headlights go out, you know, it gets, goes from, from bad to worse. That's kind of how it seems in the story of the shepherds because at, at start, there's just one angel, right? This one angel pops out of nowhere. There's the glory of the Lord. Then it goes on in verse 13. It says, suddenly... You know, it's not like, you know, like something we'd see on TV where there's a whole group of angels come walking out of the fog onto the scene. No, it's like, they just like suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, could you imagine just this moment where you're already, you know, terrified because this one angel shows up and then all of a sudden, in an instant, there's just a host of angels just pop, 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 glory, 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 glory to God in the highest. You know, because you imagine, you'd be like, ah. <laughs> you know, you're cruising down the road, 50 miles an hour, you can't see anything, and all of a sudden there's one angel, and all of a sudden there's 30 semis coming at you, <laughs> blasting their horns. <laughs> right? I mean, it'd be terrifying even more, but there was no way to do this differently. And what I love about the story of the birth of our Savior, as I shared the first week, is that in order to follow Jesus, your life has to be disrupted. But we have to trust that God has something better in store for us. And God wants to disrupt our lives because he wants us to get rid of the old baggage that we're carrying around. And for the shepherds, it was fear. They were terrified of where they stood with God and they had all the wrong stuff they've been told and experienced through the years in their suitcase of their life. And God comes to unpack it. And so this, this host of heaven shows up and they say these incredible words in verse 14 where it says, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now those are powerful words. And I don't know why it is in life, I, just probably because of our sinful nature, that so many times we don't say the things we need to say to each other, right? We always point out all the things that we do wrong. <laughs> What'd you do that for? You know, we make a big deal about all the little things. And, and God shows up to these shepherds and they're expecting the worst. They're expecting to hear criticism. And what God sends, these angels says, look, pray peace to those on whom his favor rests. God has purposely chosen you. His favor is on you. Because the good news is for you. The Savior is for you. He hasn't forgot about you. He created you. He put you on this earth. And he's come to rescue you and free you. Now, now, what's incredible is we're looking at some of the background behind the story last week where there was often family and midwives and they would come around and, and just help a mom that gave birth. And especially when there was a firstborn son, all right? It was a day to celebrate when you, when you had your first son because they are going to carry on the family name, the family tradition, all right? And so the firstborn son, which was the greater inheritance, you know, there was this, this incredible celebration. And typically, you would bring in musicians to celebrate the birth of a son. But as we learned last week, there was no one. Not very heavenly music, is it? There, who knows what animals were there in the stable, right? But what's amazing is that the ones that got to hear the music most incredible performance ever were the shepherds that couldn't afford the tickets to the theater. And they got to experience a heavenly host worshiping the birth of the firstborn, the son of the living God. And so God did bring the musicians. And they were the only ones that got to experience it and witness that incredible moment. Now, here's another cool thing that Luke points out. And this is only in Luke's gospel. Because there's a transformative moment that takes place in the shepherd's life, in this story, that Luke doesn't want us to miss. And so there's this celebration in heaven that's going on with these angels. And I want us to kind of jump forward in the Gospel of Luke to chapter 15. And Luke's only one that records this. Luke 15, verse 10. He says this. As, as the woman finds this coin and is just rejoicing. She's been looking and looking for it. And, and he goes on. He says, look, in the same way I tell you, there's this Jesus saying this, in the, uh, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 
Every time a person comes to faith in Christ, the angels are worshiping. They're rejoicing. And so there's kind of a twofold thing that's taking place here as these shepherds, as they've been carrying around all this baggage of fear and terrified of where they stood with God. And these angels show up and says, look, get rid of that old baggage because God's favor is on you. The good news is for you. The Savior is for you. And he's come to bring peace where there's been turmoil in your life and in your heart. He's come to set you free from all of that junk. And in this moment, as we're going to see as the story continues, there's a transforming moment for these shepherds of putting off the old nature and putting on the new in Christ. And the angels are not just rejoicing over the birth of the Savior, but they're rejoicing because God came to rescue the least of these and change their life. And from this moment forward, it was never the same. So we go on, and I just want to give us a couple bullet points here. Jesus came to give peace to those on whom his favor rests. He came to bring peace. And, and when we open our hearts up to God, and as David cries out in this psalm, he says, God, just help me unpack this baggage. Help me to get rid of this. And then Jesus comes and he gives peace. And I think it's just another thing, just as I'm sitting in the back of this van, just waiting for the worst possible thing to happen, that when we come and just following Jesus, that we need to stop expecting the worst when God promises you his best. God the Son came for us. And that's the power of just the, of Christmas. See, he understands that this whole baggage we carry around with us, we carry around for years, and he comes to set us free. He comes to give us perfect peace that's only found in Jesus. God the Son, by his Spirit, alive in us. Third and last thing, number three. It's not enough just to know. The next thing we see here in this story is that God calls us to step out in faith. They go from a moment of, of terror <laughs> You know, to then just greater terror of, of all these angels singing and praising and bringing this incredible, powerful message that they needed to hear. That God's favor was on them. He chose them and reveals this thing to them. And that God comes, and now he calls us to step out in faith. And so there's this moment where the, these shepherds have to make a decision. What are we going to do? Let's pick up in verse 15. This is when the angels had left them and gone into heaven. I mean, they're gone now. So, we, so you have this incredible experience with God. So now what are you going to do with it? They have to make a decision. And the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Verse 16, so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Now, it seems so simple, right? I mean, you would sit there and think, man, God showed up like that, and I had this incredible experience. Man, you bet I'm going to go. I'm going to go see this thing. But here's the thing we don't see oftentimes. This is a huge risk for the shepherds. Because to go in town meant that I could possibly pick back up that old baggage because I know as soon as I get into town, somebody will say, what are you doing here? You don't belong here, you unclean, worthless, inadequate shepherd, thief. Do I let go or do I go into town? What do I do? Right? I mean, it'd be kind of a terrifying moment to think about going into town because you know what you're going to run into when you get there. Right? Because we all know human nature. Sometimes we say things we wish we wouldn't have said and have to walk into the scene of other people seeing and knowing that we were shepherds. And how would they know we were shepherds? Because you stink like sheep. Right? You're out there in the fields, you're with sheep all day, it's pretty clear you are a shepherd by the way you dress. And so to walk into that situation would be somewhat terrifying, maybe even more terrifying than what you just experienced out there. It's like, man, this good news is for us, but now I've got a decision to make. Do I hold on or do I let go and trust God? And for these shepherds, even though it seems simple the way it's written, they said, let's go. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this old baggage. Right? 
And we come to this place like, God, I'm just tired of carrying around this junk. I just want to let it go. And they hurried off and they ran into town. And there was Mary and Joseph and the baby. The sign, the promise that God gave them was real. And in this moment, all their fear is dissolved away. Now, here's what's so cool about the way God works. You see, God made it possible for them to get to see the Savior because he wasn't born in a house. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born in an inn where they would have to be confronted by somebody opening the door and telling them to get lost. He was born in a place where they could get to, a place where they'd be familiar with. Because God met them right where they were and he made a way for them to get to the Savior just as he makes a way for us to get to him today. He knows everything that we go through and he always makes a way for us to get to him And so as the story goes on in verse 17 and 18, it says, when they had seen him, referring to Jesus, what did they do? They were changed people. Here are people that would not go and talk with anybody in town. And probably as the sun was coming up, these guys hadn't left town yet. They're going around and they're saying, they they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They were the very first evangelists to go out and share the good news of Christ. The least of them, their lives were transformed by the power of the Savior who came for them just as he came for you. And so just kind of wrapping this up, this last bullet point here is that when we learn from the story is that faith is the antidote to fear. And God wants us to learn to trust him. Even when everything inside is screaming, it's like, I don't know. I don't know if I can go through this. I don't know if I can do this. And we want to hold so tightly onto this baggage of fear in our life that the plan that God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ, is so much bigger. It's so much better. And we see it throughout the Christmas story. But it comes down to just simply trusting God and stepping out in faith and saying, okay, God, I'm going to trust you according to your word that what you have for me is so much better than this old baggage that I've been carrying around for all these years. Come and just let it go. Would you just kind of stand with me as we close in prayer? I just want to just kind of pray this morning. And, and if you're here this morning and you're just carrying fear, things that you've just been holding on to, I just want to just kind of just take a moment and just pray. And if you just kind of just put your, open your hands up, if you want to, just put your hands out in front of you and say, God, I'm just opening my heart to you this morning. Let's just pray.